Hello and welcome to Lecture 1 in Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to look at inorganic, uh, rather introductory organic chemistry. You'll see I've set out eight lectures followed by a review of all the diploma exam questions. Here's a more important breakdown. These are the knowledge outcomes prescribed by Alberta Learning. This is the material the province wants you to master in anticipation of your diploma. I'd ask you to come back to this page from time to time to get a sense of how well you're mastering the material. Um, organic chemistry then, it's the study of compounds of carbon. Almost all carbon compounds are organic, uh, with few exceptions. You're responsible for the exceptions, and they are as follows. Um, inorganic exceptions include the oxides of carbon, so carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Both the bicarbonates and the carbonates of metal ions, so here we have sodium hydrogen carbonate and sodium carbonate metal cyanides, and the, the carbides. This list of inorganic compounds, um, in my experience, is, is of historical importance only. Uh, the division between organic and inorganic compounds seems to have little practical significance these days. It's, it's rooted in the concept of vitalism. For the longest time, people thought organic compounds had an origin in living systems or vital systems. However, in 1828, Frederick Weller went into the lab and synthesized urea in a test tube, um, disproving this concept of vitalism. Organic compounds, in terms of their properties, they tend to be flammable and have very high vapor pressures. They also tend to be quite odorous. Generally, they're covalently bonded throughout and are highly nonpolar. If you attach a functional group, such as the hydroxide group you see here, you can dramatically affect their polarity. Hydroxide, this hydroxyl group introduces a highly electronegative oxygen, which uh, can make an um, organic compound uh, quite polar. Um, going back to hydrocarbons, though, without functional groups, they tend to have low solubility in water because they're nonpolar. But again, if you add a polar functional group, such as a hydroxyl group, you would increase their polarity and their solubility in water. Um, in point of fact, gasoline and water don't mix because gasoline is nonpolar, but alcohol and water mix quite nicely because alcohol includes this hydroxyl functional group. Um, moving on then, aside from combustion, organic uh, molecules tend to have slow rates of chemical reactivity. Normally, they're either gases or liquids at room temperature um, and are poor conductors of electricity. Central to their chemistry is the ability of carbon to form four strong covalent bonds. Um, it's unique in chemistry. It translates into molecules with long chain carbon to carbon backbones, um, as well as branch chain carbon to carbon networks surrounded by hydrogen or other type of atoms. Um, it can represent organic molecules in many different ways, and below are seven methods of representing a molecule of propane, for example. The first six are in the curriculum. The last is not curriculum, but it's appeared on a, lot, on a couple of diploma exams recently. Excuse me, so we'll have a look at it. So firstly, the name is propane. The condensed molecular formula, or simply the molecular formula, is C3H8. The expanded formula gives you a little more information. It shows you the carbon to carbon uh, backbone of the molecule. Condensed structural expands that slightly and it includes a line representing the covalent bonds between the carbons. The full structural or the structural formula shows you a line where there's a covalent bond between carbon to carbon or between carbon to hydrogen. The line diagram is perhaps the simplest representation of organic molecule. A line represents a bond between two carbons. So wherever a line ends, there's a carbon. In this case, there's a carbon there, there's a carbon, lost my mouse, there's a carbon there, and there's a carbon there. So this is a three carbon chain. The only exception to that is if there's some other atom here. So if sulfur was here, for example, there would be no carbon there, and there would only be two carbons on this molecule. As it is, there are no other atoms, so there's one, two, three carbons, and this is propane. And then finally, the ball and stick model. You've got three black balls, which are carbons, surrounded by eight white balls, which are hydrogens. Carbons are also assigned a degree, depending on the number of nearest neighbors to the given carbon, are also carbon. 
Now, the, the chemistry behind this designation is is preserved for university, but you are responsible to determine the, the nature of the degrees of each carbon. And here they are. So the yellow carbon I'm indicating here is a primary carbon because it's only got one nearest neighbor that's also a carbon. The green carbon is a secondary carbon because two of its nearest neighbors are carbons. The red carbon is a tertiary carbon because three of its nearest neighbors are carbons. And finally, the blue carbon is quaternary because four of its nearest neighbors are all carbons. Um, the ability of organic compounds to branch gives rise to a concept of isomerism and to what are called structural isomers. Structural isomers are a certain type of isomer that you're responsible for. Um, isomers have the same chemical formula, but they have different arrangements of the atom within the molecule. An example below will be the comparison between butane and methylpropane. Each of these has the same chemical formula, C4H10, but the arrangement of the atoms is unique to each molecule. So on the left here we see butane, and you see the four carbon atoms are in a, in a row, surrounded by ten hydrogen atoms. In the methylpropane, you've got one, two, three carbons in a straight chain, and a carbon coming off on a branch arrangement. So this would be the methylpropane. Same chemical formula, different arrangement of atoms, and, and therefore they'll have different properties. Um, this unique ability of carbon to form these four bonds gives rise to almost limitless combinations of organic compounds. Inorganic chemistry might number in the tens of thousands of molecules, but organic compounds are, are literally in the millions. The sheer number of organic compounds gives rise to a need to organize them into groups, uh, which we call homologous series. And then after we've organized the groups, to develop a formal system of naming the members of this group, of each group. In this course, we're responsible for the names, chemical formulas, structural formulas, line diagrams, and the like for the following groups. The aliphatics, and the aliphatics include three subgroups, the alkanes, the alkenes, and the alkynes, and each of these have cyclic analogs. The aromatics, and this is new language, but we'll explain the nature of these molecules over the course of the next couple of lectures. The halogenated compounds, the alcohols, including diols and triols, the acids, and the esters. Hydrocarbons are organic compounds that contain only carbon and hydrogen. They're the simplest of the organic compounds. Saturated hydrocarbon, hydrocarbons are singly bonded throughout. These are the alkanes. Unsaturated car, uh, compounds have at least one double or one triple bond somewhere throughout the molecule. These are the alkenes and the alkynes. Aliphatics. Um, aliphatics are both uh, the alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. They include both saturated and unsaturated hydrocarbons and both straight chain and cyclic. And at the end of this lecture, I've got an organizer that sort of explains this. They differ from aromatics. Aromatics contain a specialized ring structure that has six carbons in it, known as a benzene ring. And the presence of the benzene ring draws a line between aliphatics and aromatics that we'll learn. Coming back to the alkanes then, they're the simplest of the organic compounds. They can just consist of only carbon and hydrogen, singly bonded throughout. And as such, we say the alkanes are saturated. Um, they're extremely common and for the most part uh, chemically unreactive, although of course they burn quite readily. And a lot of the everyday materials that you, uh, you deal with are in fact alkanes. Natural gas that heats your house is a mixture of alkanes. Gasoline that runs your car is another different mixture of alkanes. Plastics, will come to learn, are very long uh, alkane molecules. Their precursors are alkenes, but in point of fact, they're alkanes. And candle wax is a particular alkane. The general chemical formula for an alkane is CnH2n plus 2, where n equals the number of carbon atoms and 2n plus 2 equals the number of hydrogen atoms. In terms of stereochemistry, alkanes have an AX4 configuration around each and every one of the carbons in the molecule. 
Therefore, the molecule forms a tetrahedral shape around each carbon. And they're often represented as sort of sawtooth uh, line diagrams. Um, that, that sawtooth drawing uh, stems from their attempt to represent this tetrahedral configuration. So here's the organizer I promised you. Up at the top are the hydrocarbons, and these are the compounds that include carbon and hydrogen. And they're broadly separated into the aliphatics on the left and the aromatics on the right. The aliphatics include three broad groups, namely the alkanes, the alkenes, and the alkynes. The alkanes are saturated, the alkenes and the alkynes are unsaturated. Aromatics must contain a benzene ring to be classified as an aromatic. So that's the end of my lecture. I've got a few old exam questions I'll take up with you now before I conclude. Which of the following is an organic compound? These, these questions are best answered by referring to your list of inorganic compounds. And of course that list includes the cyanides, the oxides, and the hydrogen carbonates. So B, C, and D are out, and in fact the organic compound is A. In grade 10 you would have called this carbon tetrachloride. When we learn the organic name and rules, you'll refer to it as uh, tetrachloromethane. Here's an organic molecule with a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 carbon ring structure and a 2 carbon attachment. There's no benzene ring, and I appreciate you haven't seen a benzene ring yet, but I, I described it as a 6 carbon ring. This ring has got 5 carbons, so this isn't a benzene ring. So B is out. This is an aliphatic with a 3 carbon parent chain. Well, no, the ring structure has got 5 carbons, and the side chain has got 2 carbons. So there's no three carbon structure here, and A is out. This is an aliphatic containing a double bond. No, we would see a double line somewhere throughout this molecule if there were a double bond. Which leaves D. This is an aliphatic with a five carbon ring structure, and yes, the answer is yes. One, two, three, four, five. So the answer here is D. What are the three structural isomers of C5H12? Well, the first one looks like this, and you'll see there's five carbons in a row surrounded by 12 hydrogens. This would be pentane. If you start drawing branching, to, excuse me, if you start drawing branching diagrams, you get one, two, three, four, five carbons in sort of a cross surrounded by 12 hydrogens. So the longest chain here is propane. This is dimethylpropane. And third structural isomer then, one, two, three, four. The longest chain here is four carbons, so this is butane, you'll come to know that. It's got a one carbon side chain, so this is methyl butane. That concludes my lecture on introductory organic chemistry. Hopefully you found it of value. Um, I'll see you next time when I talk about the naming of all alkanes, the, the saturated hydrocarbons. Thank you very much. And of course, any, teach, any homework your teacher is assigned would be the best follow-up to this lecture.